Hi, uh, we are having one of our the Chat Chamber episodes and we are honored uh, to welcome Angelika Nussberga. And uh, well, to introduce her, um, she is a German law professor and scholar and she has been vice president of the European Court of Human Rights and the judge in respect of Germany at the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, and uh, we are very glad and honored to welcome you. And during the interview, most probably we will mention many other positions uh, and places you have been uh, and uh, what you have done. Um, but yeah, thank you for coming. Uh, hi, Angelika. Thank you very much. Well, coming is to be written in inverted commas because we are far away. <laughs> uh, I, I wanted to ask uh, perhaps one kind of a conversation starter question. So could you please explain uh, uh, to what extent do you feel that you, uh, that being a judge to respect to Germany is being to respect to Germany or to some, to, to some extent being connected uh, and feeling this kind of a duty towards Germany? Well, uh, the official uh, way of expressing it is judge elected on behalf of Germany. So in order to make it clear that there is no way of thinking that you are something like a representative or that you are, um, yeah, you have to take the position that is the political position in your country. And I think that's essential for the working of the court. Uh, but at the same time, of course, the idea of the court is to be composed of people coming from different countries and having different backgrounds, having different inputs, having different educational um, approaches and ideas and living in different environments. So diversity, regional diversity is very important. I always understood my role as the one of... Um, arguing on the basis of what I've learned uh, in, in German law school. So uh, my German law education, the way we argue on the basis of law, that I thought is something I can bring into the court and all the others do as well. But um, otherwise you live abroad, you live in Strasbourg, you live outside your country, you see your country from outside. And I think this outside perspective is very important. Um, I, I wanted to ask, you have, uh, firstly, you started your uh, university studies uh, in Slavic languages and literature. Then you, uh, it was in 1980, in the middle of 1980s. And then you, uh, I don't know, I would say uh, requalified and started, continue your studies in law. And uh, my question is, uh, that was the time when the Cold War was, you know, coming closing, cl 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 getting closer to an end. Uh, but the Berlin Wall was still up. Uh, was your choice somehow influenced by the situation that happened in Germany, uh, or it was uh, just your willingness and um, to know, get to know more about Slavic languages? Uh, yes, I started studying uh, Slavic languages in 82. That was really still the, the real uh, Cold War. And in 82, there was no, uh, no light at the end of the tunnel. So in 82, the wall was uh, as high as ever. And we had no, no idea that it could ever change. Uh, the, I lived in a divided country, for sure. And uh, of course, in school, we were very much oriented towards England was France. We all went there, and it was very rare to come to the other, to the other part of the world. And actually, that intrigued me because I wanted to understand somehow what is going on uh, behind this wall. Uh, this wall, not only politically but also culturally, because I thought that we are cut off a very important part, cul cultural part of Europe. And for me, it was more or less like a black hole. So um, that's why I studied, uh, actually, I studied uh, German literature and, and French for teaching in, in, in schools and Russian as a, a complementary topic because Russian was not taught at that time. So you could not be a, a teacher for Russian. It was not a topic that was usually taught at school. And then I learned so much and I was in Moscow in 1985 and I understood so much how different uh, life can be, politics can be, society can be. 
But I thought that languages alone and literature, that's nice, but that's not enough for for doing building bridges or doing some some real uh, work um, that that brings together Europe. Um, and and that's why I started uh, to study law and I studied both at the same time. Uh, so I, I finished my master in, in Slavic studies uh, in 87 and law in 89. So yes, uh, the, the initiative was to know what's going on on the other side somehow. Um, and I thought that law will help me more, not only to understand, but also to have a tool to do something about it. Oh, I wanted to ask whether in your uh, practice, in your experience, there have been some questions regarding the legal interpretation of a term, of a phrase, of some kind of a concept in a Slavic language. And, and how have you solved that, if there has been such a case? Uh, yes, uh, I think it, it was always helpful to, to have this additional knowledge somehow, although, I mean, in Strasbourg, there are very many judges who speak Russian. I think Russian is uh, probably, after English, the most spoken language in, at the core, because all those coming from the eastern part of Europe, usually they do understand or speak uh, Russian. Yes, but uh, for example, uh, if you have this idea of rule of law, and then how to translate it, um, uh, so there you have all these nuances and this, these differences. And I think when you know the language, uh, it helps you a lot. And actually, uh, the Slavic language uh, or the Russian, I, I, um, I can say that I speak other uh, Slavic languages. It's, it's really only Russian. Uh, but when you hear such terms like vlasti, so the authorities, there is a different meaning in, in the term authorities, some, somebody having authority uh, or uh, vlasti, what they use in Russian. So that is already exerting power. So already in these terms, which coin the legal thinking and, and the cultural tradition, I think you, uh, you find a lot or even take, a, a, let's take the, a neutral term state. What is a state in Russian is gasudarstva. And there you have the gasudar, and that's the, the ruler. So even in the very uh, neutral description of what we are talking about, state or gasudarstva, you have a completely different uh, cultural codification, I would say. And that's interesting, even if it doesn't help you to decide a concrete case, but to have this background knowledge and to, to try to understand where other approaches come from, uh, language is helpful. I would say that you have lived um, a dream of a law student, you know, when it comes to, to um, adolescent, uh, watching a movie uh, of, uh, you know, what, what would be the best uh, law school to go to? And people always say Harvard. Uh, but you haven't studied there. You have uh, done a research there. May I ask, uh, what did you research? Well, that was in the middle of the 1990s. And I was working for the Institute um, Max Planck Institute in Munich, and I was a visiting researcher. So I was not studying, I didn't do my LLM, but I was uh, a visiting researcher. And uh, at that time, I wrote uh, what we call in German my Habilitation, that's about social standards in, in international law. And there I, uh, um, I had contact with Joseph Weiler, whom you might know, he's a very famous professor for European law. He's a, he really knows very well EU law. And he was my, in inverted commas, supervisor or my contact person. And so that was uh, the added value. But otherwise, I was doing research, just having a wonderful library and uh, um, being included in this circle in, in Harvard. It helped me a lot because um, many of the contacts I got there uh, they accompanied me, accompanied me during my life. For example, the Swiss colleague, Helen Keller, she was also a visiting researcher at the same time. And afterwards, we did a research project together on the implementation of the convention in different countries. 
So I wrote the report on Russia and Ukraine at that time. She was the general editor, so it was her project and her book. And later on, we met at the court again. And uh, she was my colleague, uh, my Swiss colleague. So uh, it was funny because we had sort of a common biography almost. And right now we are together judges at the Bosnian, uh, at the court of Bosnia-Herzegovina. So once again, we, we go in parallel and that started in Harvard in, it was 1994. Yeah. May I ask you, actually, that was been one of my questions uh, on why Bosnia and Herzegovina. How did you end up uh, being a judge there? Um, because when, 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 we, when we think of, uh, you know, judges uh, working, uh, for example, in European uh, Court of Human Rights uh, or um, being somewhere, you know, we relate them to Europe, but Bosnia is not yet in Europe. Is it somehow related uh, uh, to your other positions uh, that you have been in your life that you um, ended up uh, deciding, okay, Bosnia will be the case where I go? Well, it was not so much me who decided that I would want to go to Bosnia. Uh, it was the other way around. I was asked if I were willing to go there. And as you might know there, the Constitutional Court is quite... Um, uh, in, uh, is composed in a quite unusual way because they have these eth ethic ethnical um, distribution somehow of, of the seats. And you have three international uh, judges. That's based on the Dayton Agreement. And uh, for me, when I uh, was at the end of my mandate, I was asked if I were interested. And I had uh, for some time, I had Bosnia in my section, so I had uh, seen cases coming from Bosnia. And uh, in addition, it's a, a society still in transition, even if it's so many years now after the war, but still the wounds are not healed. And so for me, as a, in, an international lawyer, it was just a very interesting task to see such a court, how it functions, and how we can decide cases, how we can do something for the peace project because almost every institution in Bosnia and Herzegovina is divided in three parts. And it probably is only the international community that can help somehow to over, overcome these gaps. Also, um, I, I think that the international community is not very uh, successful for the time being. The, the situation is not uh, easily improving, I couldn't say that. The problem is a little bit that um, when I started, when I was sworn in, it was uh, already the crisis and the pandemic. So even for being sworn in, I couldn't go to Bosnia. So I was never in Bosnia up to now. It was, I started in, in June last year and uh, well, now it's one year and we had all written procedures. So I know the, uh, the president from former uh, meetings, uh, and, and some of the colleagues, but most of the colleagues, I don't even, well, I have not communicated with them uh, in, in presence. So for the time being, it's a very, very difficult work because as an outsider, not being present, it's really difficult. But I hope that probably uh, the next session, session now in May is, May is still a written one, but I hope that perhaps in July it might be possible to to go there. But concerning your question, it was not me who has chosen this job, but it was uh, actually, it was the Bosnian side who proposed and the, the president of the court who took it up. What have been the greatest challenges that you have been dealing with uh, regarding your uh, position as a judge? In, in general, you mean also at the European court? Uh, yeah, we can also go, go there. I, would, I, would, uh, I was thinking more about uh, your Bosnian experience. Well, I, I cannot really compare smaller and, and bigger challenges so far. Uh, the huge challenge is to, uh, to help make decisions for a country that you do not yet really know what is going on and, and to have to decide in a quite an abstract way in, a written, in written procedures. That is very difficult, although the questions right now were almost all decided by consensus. So right now, uh, these written procedures were, in my view, uh, more or less clear-cut cases, and obviously in the view of my colleagues as well, as I think with one exception, we were always um, unanimous. 
so I cannot, uh, for the time being, I cannot really talk about the Bosnian challenges so very much. Uh, I think they will come up uh, as soon as we go there and as we have to decide the cases that are more controversial that were put off the agenda. Well, not put put off the agenda, but uh, in, in as far as in writing, it was all, all already obvious that more discussion is needed. Uh, they were uh, they were transferred. Uh, but um, uh, yes, so uh, I'm now very often in the case as rapporteur, and the challenge I face is that I don't speak Bosnian. So here I do have a linguistic problem, so everything goes through translation. And when you want uh, the drafts to be changed, you have it's, it's quite a uh, uh, quite a challenge to to. Uh, to, to get to the results you want. But yeah, that's okay. That's just a, a bit tricky. And I think I have to, I have to learn <laughs> some Bosnian to, to survive better, but uh, yeah. I, I, I know this may sound a very general question, but it tends to bother my mind time to time uh, because you know, Europe is seen, uh, European Union is seen as one of the, you know, greatest um, uh, ways how to achieve democracy, how to eliminate human rights violations and establish uh, peaceful obstacles for people to live in. As well as Council of Europe. Yeah, definitely. And uh, my, my question is... Um, why, why, in your opinion, it's just your opinion and it can be based on your personal experience working as a judge, why still human rights violations take place even though we have established so many institutions and organizations that not all, also in all of the world and also, um, you know, regionally work on these issues, why they still occur? Why we still have uh, human rights violations? Well, it starts uh, with a problem that we are not always um, unanimous about what is a human rights violation. So many human rights violations have been only discovered with a, with a time. Let's take prisons. So in I think uh, even the French revolutionaries would not, not have thought that it's a, a, a violation to have a cell that is too small. So... Uh, <laughs> Although it's true that even during the revolution there were um, discussions about how to sanction and how to to, to um, what criminal sanctions would be adequate, but uh, such problems like uh, and, and the, the European Convention of Human Rights it existed for how many years until you had the Kalashnikov judgment, where for the first time it was said that uh, inhuman uh, conditions in prison in in a prison are a human rights violation. That is one of the violations we have all around. Uh, I think by now people accept that uh, uh, you have to have a minimum space, you have to have uh, hygienic uh, conditions, etc. But still, reality lags behind a lot. And we know in, in almost half of the countries of Europe, uh, there are widespread human rights violations in this context. And then uh, I think uh, your starting point is probably very optimistic. Um, I think that uh, <laughs> as if it were possible at some time to live uh, in, in a world where you do not have any, any human rights violations, I think that is, um, unfortunately, will never come true. And right now I see more the opposite phenomenon that I see that states don't um, don't accept anymore uh, uh, this as an ideal to go into this direction to allow um, manifestations on the streets to allow freedom of speech so we see more a retrogressive approach that um, uh, we find more and more really very basic human rights violations not I, I would distinguish if a uh, if a legal procedure is too long, that is inconvenient and that's a violation of human rights and you might be traumatized for, because of weight or it, it's just useless to have a judgment after 10 years. And if it, a criminal judge uh, a procedure lasts for six years, it's, it's not acceptable at all. But for me, it's a huge differentiation to see that or to see what's happening in Belarus and to see that people are just 
sort of uh, incarcerated just like that. And, and, and so um, unfortunately, I'm not even sure if we are going right now in the, in the direction of having less human rights violations or not more human rights violations. Yeah, definitely, because I don't know whether it's um, also um, being influenced by the uh, existing conditions of um, COVID measures put, but sometimes it seems that people are um, getting out of control and uh, then the government in some way trying to, uh, you know, repress uh, the existing obstacles are taking uh, not the best uh, and not the most diplomatic uh, measures uh, to do that. And uh, when it comes, for example, uh, about in Poland, but that's what you said. For one state, it understands that this, you know, is a human rights violation and the other one says, no, it's, it's not. We don't see it as that. Women don't have the right to choose to have an abortion. Uh, it's uh, not the decision for her to make. And then again, there is these discussions of uh, what maybe we can see as what most what the majority of the society would understand as acceptable. But then again, Poland can take it into account and they can say, no, we will still stay with what uh, we understand is correct and right. So um, I agree with you on this. My question would be regarding this. Um, well, there are certain coalitions in the European Union regarding ideological stand stances, the possibility to always, you know, support each other against some European Commission uh, European Commission, uh, well, fines and, 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 and actions taken against the country, uh, member state. Uh, so how would you say uh, this may be solved, that there are these coalitions that always support each other and, and uh, in a way, there, would you say that even uh, a new, a separate kind of a informative and, and, and value space uh, is uh, being developed in European Union? Well, yeah, what we observe is not very encouraging. We observe that some uh, dividing lines take up historical dividing lines, and we do see some cleavage between East and West, which is very unfortunate. But it's, uh, it's only on the surface, in my view, because the governments in uh, quite a few countries, uh, they have actually quite small majorities. So in Poland, I think the society is really divided, more or less 50-50, and for me, the same is true for Hungary, for example. So, but you see only one part. You see only the 50% that are more um, critical toward the EU and that have always these same positions. And then the, uh, they have the, what you call coalitions on the European level. But half of the society is not represented on the European level. So uh, in this in the sense, I would qualify these differences because I, I think the societies are not so different. We have in all societies, we have we have more right wing and more liberal uh, tendencies, but some are represented by their, by their right wing uh, governments and, and others, uh, the right wing um, uh representatives are in the minority. Um, I don't know how you can really overcome uh, these differences because they are actually, they are quite fundamental in my view. As we, as we see in Germany, we have also the right-wing party and nobody wants to have a coalition with them. So even to speak to them is, is so there's a real cleavage. It's not something where you, like all the other parties, they they fight and then they come together. It's not a problem. But there you have a completely different approach and and um, and it's not so easy to overcome it. In your experience um, uh, as a judge, has there been um, one or maybe two cases you remember, uh, spe especially, specifically, uh, because of the difficulty or the challenge uh, that it was for you uh, to, um, you know, decide, make an argumentation, understand the whole uh, process, how to approach it? 
Uh, well, yeah, I mean, the, the SIS case was uh, a huge challenge and you might know that I dissented together with my Swedish colleague and it was 15 to 2. And it was a very, um, uh, it was a very, very difficult case because uh, the question was um, not only about f uh, freedom of religion, but it was uh, also about um, um, the... Um, Uh, the, the scope or the limits of, of human rights jurisprudence. I still think that uh, it's correct that uh, the fact of prohibiting some sort of clothing, uh, religiously inspired clothing, uh, is something you cannot really accept under human rights um, liberal approach, how you, how you dress yourself and what you want to express about your religious feelings uh, just by peacefully dressing yourself in some way to prohibit that goes extremely far. Um, and now, uh, and, and the arguments uh, brought um, to the fore by the French authorities that you have to see the visit, uh, the face in order to- Interact with it, the person. Yeah. It's absurd because now we all cover our faces and we all run around with masks and we communicate. So it's, of course, it's cultural. It's only cultural. But at the same time, I very much um, understood uh, the French tradition, uh, the French understanding. I understood that the Assemblée uh, Parlementaire, that there was, a, I think it was unanimous or just one, uh, one vote against. So the democrat democratic procedure had been very clear that they don't want to accept uh, this um, way of dressing. And there was a, a, a real cultural fight Behind And so the question is in how far a human rights court could really upset uh, a, a democratic uh, finding uh, that represents uh, the huge majority of the people. So in this, in this sense, I was really torn uh, by, by this judgment. And I think there are two correct positions and it's very difficult to say to which outcome you should come uh, in the end. Regarding the SAS case versus France, I wanted to ask more. So, perhaps uh, regarding it, whether when you were considering uh, your opinion and when you were writing your own uh, op dissenting opinion, uh, were there some, uh, in a sense, divides? Your internal kind of, uh, not yeah, your your own internal divides that uh, that uh, perhaps have. Uh, inspired your 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 opinion well there were not so many burka cases beforehand we had in Germany we had quite a lot of jurisprudence on the veil on the um, mm. not on the veil on the headscarf on the headscarf but we had in Strasbourg we had also headscarf cases but headscarf cases are different uh, they are cases where teachers wear headscarves so they represent the state so this is the question whereas Uh, the burka case was really walking on the streets so it was it was not being linked to any institution to representing any institution so uh, in my view there were not really uh, there was one uh, one turkish case uh, which had been decided differently and which many observers thought that the court would decide in the line of this uh, turkish case and then it turned it around um, but my my own um, I don't have any experience uh, about um, uh, women wearing the the burqa. Uh, for example, my um, my colleague, one of my colleagues at the Constitutional Court in Germany, um, he has grown up in Afghanistan because his father was a teacher in Afghanistan in the German school in Afghanistan. So as a young man, he was living in Afghanistan, and for him. Uh, uh, women wearing the burqa were completely normal. That was not my my aspect. I have never lived in such a society. For me, it's uh, as strange as for most of the people. So you you see them very rarely. And and no, I didn't have any um, any uh, personal experience. For me, it was really a theoretical theoretically very important problem about uh, minorities, majorities, democracy. And uh, it was just uh, this this piece of um, uh, the, the veil uh, that that triggered the whole discussion. But there are a lot of problems, as I say, about the 
the, the scope of human rights protection and democracy behind. Um, I, I would like to ask for your opinion. Uh, we, we know that there has been many different kind of situations uh, seen in the world uh, where um, it has uh, been challenged, uh, the sovereignty uh, of a state, for example, the case uh, of Libya when NATO intervened there. Um, and uh, it was also, the intervention was based mainly on uh, the fact that there has been uh, human rights violations, there has been uh, also um, crimes uh, of, against the humanity and uh, things like that. Um, how how do you see this? Whether this um, whether it is justifiable um, for a um, an organization uh, to intervene in a sovereign state uh, or the non-intervention principle is uh, stronger in such case? Well, that's one of the crucial questions of international law and one of the main dilemmas. I personally, I'm very reluctant to, to think that it's a good thing to, to intervene for several reasons. Uh, first, you have this declaration, I think, by 70 states or even more, uh, arguing that uh, they don't accept it as a development of international law. So to base it on, um, on customary international law, I think it's just not possible because you have too many who are against. So uh, that the, such an exception should have been developed is, is uh, I think uh, it's difficult to, to argue like that. It also uh, is more uh, an intervention possibility in favor of bigger countries, of stronger countries, because um, against strong countries, there would not be any humanitarian interventions as we have seen in Chechnya. So uh, whoever would think about an intervention there, nobody. So it's quite a, a asymmetric uh, uh, way of interfering. And then uh, from a quite a practical um, approach, I think history has shown us that those who act sort of uh, in the... Um, under the symbol of doing something good, uh, um, they turn around to do something evil as well. So we have a lot of human rights violations by the troops marching in, in a state, uh, just to say Abu Ghraib or something like that, where you see that when people, uh, when soldiers exert violence in order against those who, who commit uh, crimes themselves, uh, violence is, is um, answered by violence. And uh, it, it's a spiral of, of cruelty. And I'm not really sure uh, that it's uh, basically uh, something uh, that is uh, helpful for um, in the end, in, in the end. On the other hand, I know that uh, when you look at concrete situations like Rwanda, you would say, well, there would have been possibilities of intervening. But we also see this uh, huge amount of misuse. So uh, I think uh, even uh, the, yeah, well, it's more or less whenever you attack, the first way of, of arguing is, um, it's for humanitarian purposes, and uh, there might always be some minority uh, crying out that there are war crimes and then, or, 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 or crimes against humanity, and then to justify it. So it's used as a justification, and the approach of the UN Charter was not to have that. Um, we all know that the Security Council doesn't function as it should function, and 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 the system needs to be corrected. But just to say, I'm I'm very reluctant. Uh, it goes back in history. It, it, it's this tradition and this continuity of thinking of a just war and and having good reasons to wage war. And I'm just very, very skeptical. And um, I wouldn't exclude it for, uh, let's say, the most obvious uh, uh, cases. But generally, I, I would rather argue against yes. humanitarian interventions. Um, a bit different but still uh, in a sense similar I, I wanted to ask um, there have been cases and, and, and of course concerns regarding uh, reservations uh, not reservations sorry the uh, the the measures the interim measures that are being uh, you know for example ordered for a country to be taken in, in certain cases uh, for example the Bouillet case versus Belgium 
uh, of extradition of a of a charged person uh, of of uh, foreign descent, uh, not not to in a sense not to extradite them to the U.S. and and uh, the while the Europe it, while the Human Rights Court said that of course there should be this interim measure not to extradite this person to U.S. Uh, while the judgment is being uh, considered. Uh, but at the same time, the national institutions, uh, the national institutions of Belgium, the, uh, their constitutional council, uh, said otherwise, and, and they implemented this extradition. So to what extent would you say these interim measures are effective in, in certain, uh, in certain uh, situations, and how can one ensure that they are uh, followed? Well, there are many examples where the interim measures were not uh, effective. Just the last famous example is the Navalny example, where the court ordered Navalny to be released and, and Russia argued that is a political judgment and they would not do anything. So um, it's, it's always like, um, uh, you know, this famous saying by Henk, who said uh, it's almost in all cases, in almost all countries, almost always implement always almost all judgments, and some are not implemented. And these are usually the most important ones and the most visible ones. And like the case in Belgium, like the Navalny case, these are cases where interim measures were not implemented. We have hundreds and thousands of cases concerning, for example, expulsion cases of refugees where they were implemented and people were not brought back to their countries. The court has established this, um, this uh, sort of sanction system, though, uh, that if um, an interim measure is not implemented to consider it as a human rights uh, violation, and a special, an extra human rights violation. And I think in this Belgian case, uh, Belgium had to pay a lot uh, of compensation, high compensation. But of course, he was in the United States. So that was, that was, uh, could not be uh, changed anymore. So in the end, uh, I think we see there uh, the limits of international law as we see them in, in other cases. Concerning interstate cases, we also have uh, now uh, quite often these very vague um, interim measures, like in the conflict, military conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, or in former times between Georgia and Russia. So the court would basically just say uh, uh, you have to keep your human rights um, guarantees, you have to your obligations, you have to fulfill your obligations, uh, but it, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't help uh, in an immediate sense because when such a, um, um, a, 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 a such a border has already reached of, of hostilities to stop by some good uh, good message by some of the court uh, that is probably naive. Still, I think the court should do it and should show um, um, what the right thing to do would be. But in such situations, I would be quite skeptical that you can stop military invasion or hostilities from happening. I would like to give you a an different answer in this context, but I, uh, looking back at the cases I have seen while I was at the court and now afterwards, I cannot but be skeptical. Um, I, I actually have, uh, a, I think, Two questions in one question. Um, you are also um, a specialist. Like you, you, you how to you research and you uh, look into the uh, interaction between public international law and domestic law. And uh, my question is: um, We see how uh, states basically when they. Um, Join, uh, join some specific I don't know convention uh, or charter yet because it's you know it's not you know it's voluntary for them to join. Um, they give up certain freedoms. Uh, uh, they give certain part of their sovereignty. Um, and um, how to how to manage make public international law. Um, less general, more specific to eliminate um, to eliminate uh, security threats, to eliminate attacks, to eliminate uh, actions that um, 
make this world um, this violent. I know it's it, it's it's very broad and it's uh, yet difficult to answer, but uh, I want to know your opinion. Um, well, when you give up sovereignty rights um, for what you say conventions, charters, like let's take the example of the Istanbul Convention, and then you you uh, you try to implement them uh, in the in the country itself. That's one part of the story where uh, you try to improve what's happening inside countries for specific persons like women in the in the Istanbul Convention. But what you are talking about is to use international law more for peace and security and for uh, giving up sovereign rights in order to, to avoid conflicts. And that's the story, the narrative of the United Nations. And there we see... Um, yeah, it's it's once again it's a glass of water which is half full and half empty. So uh, I wonder uh, what we can say. Um, uh, well, I think the first half of the 20th century was much worse, and there we had the League of Nations, which was weaker, and the system was stronger afterwards. But um, I, I wonder in how far we can really say it was the system of the United Nations that helped uh, conflict from occurring or it was just the, the situation in the Cold War that the risks were too high starting uh, starting whatever small war. That was, uh, it was always all or nothing. And, and that uh, uh, sort of... Uh, caused the fact that we had a cold war and not a war, not a hot war during that time. Um, giving up sovereign rights for avoiding conflicts. Um, yes, uh, we do have this example of the, of the UN system, but still now, as you see with the conflict, Armenia and Azerbaijan, when you have such a deep rooted historical, cultural conflict, and you have just a small part of the territory and both parties think that it's theirs. I wonder in which way you could give up sovereign rights to solve such a conflict. I think it's just an illusion. I think neither of those parties would accept to give sovereign rights to a third state or something like that, or to a community of state. The best was the best model is for is in my view the EU the EU where you where um, we did give up quite a lot of sovereign rights and I thought well now with a let's say the Hungarian minority in Slovakia the Hungarian minority in in uh, Romania it, it's not so important anymore these. Um, uh, these uh, borders, because you can you can cross the border without any problem, etc. But still, you see the conflicts are not really solved, and whatever happens, they they come up again. Um, yes, the the EU model is probably uh, uh, the best we ever had, but still, it's not good enough to to give us uh, really safe guarantees. My, I wanted to ask a question regarding uh, further guarantees of human rights protection in Europe, because as you already mentioned, uh, you have a concern that the human rights course is not going uh, in the most positive direction at this moment. Uh, therefore, there have been some questions regarding whether the EU should be accessing the Council of Europe and the uh, and of course, th therefore, the European Convention on Human Rights. So what would be your opinion and your ma main concerns uh, regarding the EU's accession uh, to the ECHR? Well, that was, uh, <laughs> they already tried, and it was the court in Luxembourg that stopped the process, uh, despite the fact that all the states and all the organs were in favor. So it was just the court's position not to allow it. Now they have started to uh, negotiate again. I, I wonder where they will arrive. Well, um, of course it would be good, uh, but um, from a pragmatic point of view, the situation is such that we have the Bosphorus um, Presumption, and we have a lot. And after Bosphorus, we had quite a lot of 
judgments, uh, which showed uh, the way how to hold responsible member states for human rights violations that occur uh, sort of on the account of the EU, as a matter of fact. So the jurisprudence is very elaborated. It's very sophisticated. It's difficult for outsiders. I think for non-lawyers, it's probably not possible to, to really understand it. So, um, yes, I think it it would be uh, um, just a good uh, step to for the EU to come into, into the system, but substantially, um, when you look at the at the specific cases, uh, I wonder if there would be a huge difference. So, uh, if you talk about regression of human rights, I think um, that would not be the point to to improve the situation in in general. That is more uh, a point for us as lawyers that we like uh, to talk about these. Uh, uh, layers of the European legal systems and the questions about the last words of the different courts. But um, from the pragmatic point of view, um, we have other human rights violations that concern uh, me much more than than those. And how? And how about? Uh, and how about states that very explicitly we have already mentioned? one of these cases, uh, for example, the Navalny case. How about member, state, member states of the Council of Europe which have the record of not following these decisions? And would you say that expulsion is the, the solution to it or should there be a more delicate response? I think that diplomatic response is much better because uh, if you stop uh, the dialogue uh, in the framework of such a convention as the Human Rights Convention, then you rebuild the Berlin Wall in a, in a sense of not having exchange, not sitting around the same round table anymore. Um, I, I don't want to, to be naive uh, about the situation as it, as it is right now, but we are still uh, continuing our dialogue. We see the judgments are not implemented. We talk about it. But if, uh, if a state withdraws, there is no, uh, no possibility of dialogue. And for those concerned by human rights violation, um, they lose even more. Now they might not get the compensation, they might not be, get their judgments implemented. But afterward, they have not even a European voice saying that their rights are violated. So uh, in this sense, I think uh, it should be uh, the task for diplomacy to, to try to continue, but at the same time to uphold the authority of the system, the credibility of the system. So if the non-implementation is too widespread, at a certain point, the, the whole system is questioned. And this has to be avoided, of course. So the most important factor in this is the ability for each citizen to apply uh, in uh, to apply for the court, even though the state may not follow the judgment itself, right? Yes, because you still have a clear message uh, that is not only a message by one state criticizing another state, uh, but it's a message of a court that has been set up with a long history and a lot of authority, and that's a different, a different uh, critique coming from outside, outside and helping those uh, who feel oppressed. I, I, I wanted to ask you how about um, we we know we do realize that of course a judge uh, is uh, looking at the law, it looks uh, at the situation, it uh, analyzes and, and, and all the process that is you know part of your job. But um, you do, you you have dealt with human rights violations on your everyday life and. Uh, have you ever been in such situation where you uh, get this emotional uh, part as a human being? You know, humans are emotional. And uh, have you had a, a case which got deep inside of you in your heart and you... Evoked sympathy. In yeah. A uh, yes, of course. When you read the files and you see uh, what has happened... Uh, sometimes you uh, you 
feel it as you as if you read a story of of somebody you like and and you you just feel what they have felt but uh, and and that is especially true for for family law cases in the wide sense so people not able to see their children people where children are taken away uh, divorce cases where you see both sides um, also uh, cases, yeah, separation of parents and children. That was probably the most intriguing cases. You also see cases where you see uh, horrible photos, and and you you think it's what would, how can can the family of the person's concerns continue living? Yes, you do, but um, you have to distance yourself. You have to. You have to, and and what you see, the file is, is sometimes really thousands of pages or hundred, let's say hundreds of pages, uh, but then you condense the, the story and the story is just um, the authorities took away the child because of, t -t -t -t. And, and then you have just one paragraph. You know the story behind that is very uh, long and intense with all the details, and it's always the detail that emotionalizes you. But the the law allows you then to summarize those points that count for assessing the case. But still, I mean, personally, you wouldn't forget these cases. You have them in your mind. You carry their the heritage with you, and and that's part of your life. Uh, but it's always like that when you have a professional life, when you're a policeman and you see a suicide scene or whatever, you will carry it with you as well, although you have to react prof professionally. Mm -hmm. So always you need to be very mindful about uh, the text you are reading, right? And, and, and having this kind of certain professional reservation towards it. Yes. My, my, uh, as we are... Well, slowly approaching the end, I, I wanted to ask two questions about the future, of course. Uh, the, the, the future of, of uh, both the uh, European Union, whether we can see some ev emergence of, a new, of new uh, values as the federalization of it. And uh, yes, we can start with that question then. Would you say that, uh, that uh, EU is approaching some kind of a form of federalization, especially given the global challenges that arise as terrorism, global health, and uh, as well as climate change. And or perhaps it's something different. Perhaps it's something more delicate. Perhaps it's something, uh, uh, yeah, different in your opinion. How would you see that? Uh, well, one part of the answer would be that Britain has left and Britain was always the state most opposed to the states coming closer together. So this would be a starting point to say, well, now uh, the one opposing whatever um, uh, uh, federalization uh, is out. Uh, but on the other hand, I don't see any uh, any. Um, uh, direction or ar any orientation. Um, when I look at the at the stage, just I think it was today uh, they wanted to to adopt a resolution on uh, what is happening in the Near East uh, in in Israel, and and it was Hungary that blocked. So uh, you see this uh, difference of opinion, and I would even see say. You talk about the challenges for all, like climate change and, and, and migration. And my understanding is that in some countries, even the perception of what are the most challenging problems right now is different. So the challenges, uh, when you see, uh, like uh, we already mentioned, Poland going back to its heroic uh, past and, and having a very um, different approach of what is important, what is what is in the... Um, what is being discussed mostly, uh, we don't have the same perception in, in the different countries. And that would already be a basis that we have the same um, appreciation that it's a, there is a huge need to come together uh, closer in Europe. I don't think that this is shared. I see the reverse tendency of... Uh, of really stressing that national states should should be strong and 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 right now we cannot see a sort of um, there might 
we, we couldn't preview the, the pandemic, but the pandemic has shown us that we were not closely working together. We were closing the borders and, and the European approach was a very disappointing one concerning vaccination, concerning now the green passports, whatever. It's, it's, um, it's not a good, um, <laughs> unfortunately, it's not a good experience, uh, this pandemic. Although it concerns us all, we didn't have a common answer. And so it was a test for the EU and it has failed in my, in my view. And that's a very unfortunate development uh, for coming closer, closer together. We have to overcome this, um, this um, experience of failure, perhaps, uh, and, and to restart. But it hasn't made things easier. And my second future question is about uh, how would you see the future of legal arrangement in Europe, uh, both the European Union and the Court of Justice, as well as the Council of Europe and the European Court of Human Rights. So would you say that you see already some developments, some kind of a path, uh, or would you say that uh, there is still debates about how this future might look? I think for the EU, it all depends on, um, on the question in how far the EU will take up new member states. If they will integrate, let's say, Albania, Albania, Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, Serbia, these states in, in the Balkan, um, then the situation will be uh, probably different because the um, potential conflicts or the different approaches are still uh, more visible than they are now. Um, and then probably the, the fact of finding compromises will still be on a lower level. The compromise will, will still be weaker. If they don't uh, enter or don't enter in the near future, uh, it might still be possible to, to find compromises. But um, in my view, what we observe all the time is that it's very, very difficult to find compromises on whatever topic. And that um, already now was 27, um, uh, makes it very, very uh, time consuming uh, for for defining new policies. Uh, sometimes I, I see it optimistically and think, well, now they have arrived at a good solution, even after a long discussion. But it, it uh, as long as we are all sover sovereign states, it will remain a difficult, um, a difficult way to go forward. And I don't see any uh, future prospects of making it easier. I don't. I don't see. I, I think there might be some topics where uh, it's it's easier because the interests are more uh, oriented in the same way. But in general, um, the as I said, the perception and the uh, national interests are too different for making compromises very smooth. So I think, in my view, it will go on as it did now with. Dif difficult compromise finding and uh, balancing interests and taking a long time to come somewhere to arrive somewhere and, and the same for and the same for also the European Court of Human Rights right uh, for the European Court of Human Rights um, we see that uh, they have um, uh, they are always bouncing um, between uh, going further uh, with that jurisprudence, developing it further and uh, being cautious, uh, using the margin of appreciation for not, uh, in inverted commas, um, going too far in, in, in the other direction. So there as well, I see this balancing and I, I think we will have courageous judgments going in one way, but we will also have judgments where they leave a large uh, margin of appreciation that is criticized by many. So they they will have the same uh, tensions inside and will also, as the EU, have this necessity of finding compromises that go somewhere a middle way. I, I would say that this interview was truly amazing. I enjoyed all of it. And maybe you, uh, before we end this uh, interview maybe you have a question you would like to ask us or something you would like to say that we haven't asked you and something for our listeners <laughs> in, future, 
perhaps future uh, judges and future legal professionals? Um, well, I wonder um, what <laughs> um, you ask me all those questions. You could have asked them whatever student could have answered and given the perspective. Um, why are you... Uh, what are you? What do you expect from somebody who has worked in this international field? You want, uh, you you. What do you hope for? Do you hope that I'm very optimistic and and I'm telling you everything's going to be great and no problem? Or do you want a more realistic out view? Do you want to? Do you want me to share my skepticism? What is? I mean, you are a, a young generation now living in Riga. So um, would you be happy to, to have in the end somebody like me say uh, everything will be great in, in, in 10 years to give you more uh, sort of um, optimism for your future? Or what, what would you expect me to argue? Um, personally, I, I truly enjoy skepticism and uh, realist point of view because saying everything will be fine... Um, Everybody can say that. Uh, mom can tell you that, even though she is working, uh, I don't know, as a, a teacher, for example. Um, but uh, I like when an expert in a field, when uh, he or she has done the research, uh, have looked through a topic, has worked with it every day for a period of years, can tell me the situation, the reality is like this. Don't expect something happening uh, to the positive side uh, in, I don't know, in a week or two. Everything takes time and sometimes even time cannot fix things um, because they have ingrained so much in the roots of a culture of a state or um, their practice of approaching, I don't know, they have this legal system existing there for, I don't know, uh, hundreds of years and they will not change that. that. And then I love skepticism. Yes, I truly enjoy uh, that. So thank you for uh, being honest. And uh... I would say the same. Uh, I, I, as a, as an interviewer, uh, as a student, I'm really always interested in in a more in, in a person with a lot of expertise in a certain field laying out the facts that are the most valuable facts in understanding the uh, a certain question, and then adding the, the added value of it of of interpreting that and 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 understanding certain you know challenges and. And uh, but in the end, I'm not sure whether um, true criticism or skepticism is perhaps uh, what I want to hear. But I want to always hear how these challenges might be solved. And I think what uh, the what more ex ex well more experienced people in uh, in field like you, uh, I would say, is that you can, you know, give this inspiration also to the new generation where to look, where to find the answers, perhaps. And, and, and I think this is something that I uh, gained from this interview. Uh, I would like to point out one thing. I, I remember I have my bachelor thesis defense tomorrow. And uh, I had a, a support session. And I very much remember how our bachelor uh, program director said, um, when you're asked the question how to improve something, don't say making new conventions uh, because it never solves the problem fully because we have so many conventions already and the problem is not being solved uh, the way we would like to be. Um, and uh, yeah, I love when the people say um, the reality, the truth. And sometimes we have to understand that there are things we cannot change. It's out of our hands, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. I mean, uh, when it's about analyzing the facts, that's one thing. And when it's about finding solutions, then all the generations will work together. So the young generation has their approach and we have our approach and we have just to, to exchange our points of view. That's the value, I think, added value. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, really. This was a, a, an insightful, uh, I would say, an engaging interview. Uh, and, and I would say perhaps to some person, this might be the turning point of them becoming a legal professor. <laughs>